Ah, the tech stuff, you know how this goes. So hello everyone and welcome to the Women with Mojo conversation series. We missed last month, so I'm especially excited about this month's guest. But for those of you who are new, the Women with Mojo series is just a conversation that I have with an inspiring woman over 40. When I started my Midlife Mojo, my mission was really just to help women support them in their physical and their emotional health, health so they can thrive during their midlife years and beyond. And I created this series specifically to highlight women who I feel who are out there living their mojo, right? Mojo is more than just looking and feeling good. It's doing good in this world. And so I just wanted to highlight some of those ladies. And I'm really excited to bring on today's guest. I've got Melissa Jacoby. And I have known Melissa. I met Melissa first when we were about 16 years old at a youth group event and kind of just took off from there. So I'm going to bring Melissa on. We'll chat a little bit, get to know her a little bit, and then learn about her really powerful, inspiring story. So let me get Oh, real quick before I say also, in the description, two things. Uh, if you are want to chat with us, go ahead and click the link so that we can see whose name it is. That helps me with my streaming service. And then also I put links so you can learn more about Melissa. And then as you learn more about her story, there's also a link there to um, donate to her cause. All right. So let me bring on Melissa. All righty. Hello, hello, my friend. Hello. How are you? I'm good. I am so glad to have you here today for sure. So I mentioned to you guys that Melissa and I, right, 16, we've known, known each other since. But the truth is we were we were great friends in high school. Or I actually dated a boy from her town. I'm going to show this picture of you guys here. Oh, we no. double dated to the prom. There we are. Look at that hair. Oh my Lord, right? There's a there lot of hair. A lot of hair. Oh God, those were good memories. <laughs> and so I have known Melissa for a long time. But after high school, we did lose touch. And I really, we really didn't connect probably until four or five years ago, you know, back on Facebook. And then a couple of years ago again, when she joined my intermittent fasting program, even more and, you know, got reconnected. So I'm excited to kind of hear your journey because I kind of know the I know the end result of your journey but I don't really know you know what went on um, from the beginning to now and so for you know Melissa I just want to kind of just read this real quickly that she um, she lost her first husband Perry Levy 20 years ago just a year and a half after getting married and she overcame these just terrible circumstances and turned it into a beautiful legacy ride of love and so we're going to really kind of talk about her journey um, with all of that and I just really want you guys to hear uh, her story and just the impact that she's had um, took her kind of I love that you, you, you sent me some about your father, I think your father, your father-in-law who turns yeah. lemons, yeah, into lemonade. And you, that's truly what your family did in this instance. So um, before we get started, Melissa, into your story though, I always like to just have my guests, just as it gives people a little glimpse into who they are, just maybe share something that right now is either making them happy or they're grateful for in their life. Just what's going on for you? Um, well, I would say the biggest change right now, since over the global pandemic, there wasn't a lot of change. We were all, you know, batting down the hatches. Um, what's making me really happy right now is my two teenage boys are away at overnight camp for seven weeks. <laughs> and Mostly. so I feel, <laughs> I feel kind of guilty saying that, but my husband and I need it. They need it. It's time off technology. I do work full time. So that stayed throughout the pandemic. But just, you know, being able to log off at the end of the night and not have to carpool somebody to lacrosse or, you know, play dates or, you know, all of that. And just time to reconnect with my husband and spend a little more time on myself and with my friends. That's making me pretty happy right now. That's perfect. And that's exactly what I'm doing this summer. I'm an empty nester myself. So I'm testing out my empty nesting because next year we got one year left with her. And it is, I, I do get that. I think as moms, it's like that you you feel a little guilty that you're feeling happy that you've got your freedom. But I can promise you our kids are happy and they aren't feeling guilty that they're away. And so I think that as any midlife woman, you know, who's got their kids, you know, we should embrace the times we're together and embrace the times we're apart because I think we both, we, they grow when they're away from us. And it also, like you said, it gives you that time to reconnect with your partner that it's so 
hard to do, especially with two teenagers in the house and they never go to sleep. And, you know, it's just people say when it's hard when, you know, to connect with your husband when they're babies. I'm like, I think it's harder when they're older because they're up to all hours of the night. It's like, you know, they're always around. So, um, so I get it. So thank you for sharing that for sure. So I want to kind of get into your story a little bit. And ladies, I'm going to be sharing some pictures um, that Melissa was kind enough to share with me as she goes to her story a little bit. But let's kind of start right at the beginning. So, you know, where, you know, kind of tell us like how you met Perry, you know, when did you get married? What was like life like before the diagnosis? Okay. So we have to take our time back to 1995. I was a third year law student and um, I was dating somebody my parents and my family didn't really like. And my sister met Perry um, at a Hamptons share house because he was a fraternity brother of one of our cousins. So my, and he was moving to the Boston area, which is where I live. And the guys was, oh, Melissa will introduce you around and she'll show you around Boston and she's great and she's fun and she has a ton of friends. So I got introduced to him and did what my sister asked me to do. I, you know, showed him around Boston. I actually looked at apartments with him and just really started developing a friendship while I was in a relationship with somebody else. Um, and then pretty quickly, I realized this was a special guy and broke it off with the other guy and we started dating. So that was 1995. I was third year law student. And um, by 1997, two years in, we got engaged. We got married in November of 97 in a double wedding. I don't know if you know that, Jill, with my sister. So my sister got engaged three days after I did, she'd been dating her now husband for a year. I'd been with Perry for two years and we had the biggest bash in Boston. We were all over the Boston globe, two sisters getting married together, huge hotel, big bash wedding. I did not know that. I think now I think about, I think I've seen a picture now that you say that, but yeah, I'm going to go back off. I want to show a couple of pictures of that right here, here when you were, let me go back. Oop, I hid Melissa. Oops. Wrong person. There we go. She's coming back. There you go. Sorry about that. No problem. So we had this big wedding. Perry was one of four brothers. Um, I think you have a picture in the stack. Um, Jill went away, so hopefully she's going to bring a picture up. Okay, so first, let me just pause here for a second. Perry was in a major athlete, a triathlete, a marathon runner. I was not. I mean, I dabbled at the gym, like in the 90s, what everybody did. They went, you know, and did step aerobics. But that's really where my athleticism started and ended. Um, but he was truly an athlete. He ran the 99th running of the Boston Marathon somewhere in those years, which was huge. And this is a perfect picture of him. And I love it. And we keep it around. On his um, arm has a fake tattoo. It says victory or death. And that was so him. He was um, spirit of competition, true warrior out there. So that was him in 91. This was before I met him. Um, this is a picture from our wedding. He is uh, the one with the white tie. Um, his other brothers, uh, so one of four boys, which is really interesting as we move my story forward because I'm now married to a man who is also one of four boys, very interesting. Um, but again, the Big Bash wedding in 1997, um, we moved in together, we bought a house, um, and in 1998, I'm sorry, I'm going to get my, no, 1999, um, in May of 1999, we took a trip to Japan. I think the next picture is of us in Japan. So this is inside at the Tokyo Dome. Uh, watching baseball in Japan. And it was two weeks when we came home from this trip in June when Perry started uh, feeling ill. And immediately we thought he picked up something in Japan. We're very adventurous eaters. We were eating everything raw, not raw, kind of cooked, not cooked, off the streets, uh, really taking advantage of the incredible Japanese culture. And um, he started not feeling well when we got home. And so after a series of doctor's appointments um, and a trip to the emergency room, we got the diagnosis actually on July 4th 
of 1999. So the nation's holiday of July 4th is always a reminder to me that um, that was the weekend that he got diagnosed. And just a note to anybody, holidays are not a good time to be in the hospital, especially over July 4th, because new residents come in on July 1st. That's like when the medical residents leave and the new batch starts. You have all these brand new doctors that don't know anything. And oh it was a really, a, real, a really challenging time. So don't get sick over July 4th weekend. Um, so he was diagnosed with small bowel cancer. And we didn't know that until he went in for surgery because he had a blockage and his family has a history of Crohn's disease. So we thought it was just Crohn's. So was he having he stomach, stomach issues or things like that? Yeah, yeah. He had a little IBS um, throughout the years, but wasn't didn't pay too much attention to it. Shortly before this, his younger brother was diagnosed with Crohn's. So when he went into the hospital and they thought it was a blockage, um, they knew they had to do what's called a resection to remove it and assumed it was Crohn's. And then the biopsy came back to um, reveal that it was small bowel cancer, which is very rare. Most of you have heard of colon cancer. Who hasn't? It's one yeah. of the leading causes of death. This was small bowel cancer, which is, you know, the small intestine, but very similar. Um, and was that in his family at all or nothing at all? Nothing at all with his family. This was July 4th. They thought they got it all. And um, we went home from the hospital a couple, you know, 10 days later after he came out of surgery and recovery and he started chemotherapy in the beginning of August. And he was a guy who was gonna beat it, right? He's, again, you saw the competitor, they thought they got it. Um, now it's the middle of August. He's not feeling well. We go to his family's house for the Jewish holidays, which is always in the beginning of September. And we were back in the hospital September 18th. They um, went back in thinking maybe it was scar tissue that was causing him the issues. And the cancer had spread everywhere. That quickly. Holy moly. So that was September 18th. Remember, we just got the diagnosis July 4th. He passed away October 20th of that year. He never came out of the hospital. Wow. So it was lightning speed. And he was 32 years old. Crazy. So, yeah, that was crazy. And just thinking about it kind of gets me, um, because I think of all those moments in the hospital. I was 29 years old. I was working. I was running back and forth to the hospital. He was still working, you know, from the hospital on his computer. Um, and at some point, probably in early October, uh, and, and we hadn't even told people that he had cancer. He was like, I'm going to come out the other side of it and then tell people I beat it. You know, people, our close family knew, but we hadn't told our extended friends. There was no, you know, caring bridge sites and, you know, GoFundMe. There was right. none of that back then. There wasn't even Facebook. So I was going to say, right. Yeah. There wasn't a way to communicate in a big way. Um, you know, what was going on in our lives. So sometime in early October, a nurse pulled me aside. And obviously, I was very friendly with all the nurses. And, you know, she asked me if I had signed a do not resuscitate order. And I didn't even know what to say. I was like completely flabbergasted and completely fell apart thinking I've been married for less than two years. And you're telling me I have to sign a do not resuscitate. Yeah. Um, and that was probably a week and a half before he passed. And did you, so first of all, I can't even comprehend that, right? Here you are in the parts, beginning part of your life, ready to plan your whole life and seeing that vision and it being just snatched, like literally that, I mean, that's the only word because it was so quick. And so did, when you said only a week before, did you kind of know that was happening? I mean, when she was talking to you, did you know that the, I mean, or did you guys still have that hope up to the very end? I mean, was there any point that you kind of knew, you know, it was? So we still have, I mean, he went in on September 18th. And the fact that you can remember these days, right? We're talking about yeah. 1999 and it's 2021 yeah. right now, but yeah. I remember these moments. So September 18th, we went in, he went in. They said that it had spread, but, you know, chemotherapy, radiation, we, we just thought we had tools in our bag to continue to fight. And maybe he wouldn't live another 50 years, but we thought we had time. 
Um, and maybe I wasn't, you know, they always say when there's some serious medical, bring somebody else with you to listen, because sometimes when you're emotional, you don't hear everything. Mm -hmm. So it's very possible they were telling me he's not going home or he's not getting better. But I honestly did not hear that until that moment when the nurse asked me to sign the DNR. Um, his parents lived in Connecticut. He was in the hospital in Boston. They were coming back and forth. One brother lived locally. So he was in and out. My parents were a huge support for me that are here. Um, and then at that moment, my sister came into town because again, we just didn't know what was gonna happen. And I wasn't sleeping at the hospital. I was going home at night, coming in, working. Mm -hmm. He was okay until he wasn't. Right, yeah, wow. That is, I mean, an incredible short journey, right? I mean, you know, to have had all of that happen and so forth. So after he passed, I mean, you obviously you mentioned you had a lot of support around you, which just seems, you know, not everybody is as, as fortunate as that. So that I'm sure was a good help to you. But how did you as, you know, a young, like you said, in your 20s, I mean, you know, this wasn't what you're in any way, shape or form is on anybody's radar. And, you know, especially with a healthy guy like him. So how did, you know, you find your way to kind of cope with this to kind of, especially in those early days, that first year or so? So I was really lucky. My sister who had, you know, had a six month old baby um, came and stayed with me for a little bit. We had a house. We had just closed on our house in the spring. Um, then I had a friend who actually had just moved back to town and she was sleeping over for a couple of days. And I said, I think I, I'm not ready to sell the house. I think I need to have somebody move in with me. And she raised her hand while she was lying in bed with me. She's like, I'll move in with you. Um, so immediately I wasn't alone and that was really important. Mm -hmm. Um, I also, um, was really fortunate that people came out of the woodwork and, and handed over ideas. And one of the most critical ones was joining a young widows support group. Who even knew that existed? Yeah, I yeah. didn't even. I didn't know any young widows. I didn't know it existed. Um, but one of the hospitals near where I live did have a young widows support group. Um, and so I joined three weeks after Perry passed away. We met weekly, and it was interesting because everybody in the group was between the age of. I was the second to youngest. There was a twenty-seven-year-old woman. Um, up until we're gonna laugh with our midlife mojo mm -hmm. they were in their late 40s which mm -hmm. being 29 that's not a young widow right she's in her right. late 40s she's got teenagers yeah. and here i was with no kids and um but thinking about it now right uh, we would be young widow i mean young yeah. right so yeah. a whole life ahead of you and that was that was an incredible support to be with other people going through similar times, you know, being sad and devastated, but also finding moments of lightness and laughter. And the, the group coach used to say, what don't you miss? And for me, it was Perry's disgusting, dirty, sweaty workout <laughs> laundry. And looking at the yes. side of him, he probably had a lot of it. <laughs> oh, he had a lot of it. It was so gross. I couldn't get the stink out, you know. So, you know, we would have those moments. I also did go into private therapy because, you know, Perry was a fighter and I didn't know back then that I was a fighter, but I was 29 years old. I had my whole life ahead of me. I wanted to be married. I wanted to have children and I needed the tools to deal with the grief. And grief is not, you know, a moment in time. Grief is an evolution. I still grieve today for Perry, yeah. um, even though I'm fully enthralled and thrilled with my life. Yep. I think about them all the time, but having those tools plus my family and friends, you do discover who your friends are mm -hmm. um, and how people deal differently with grief. I had very close friends that didn't know what to say and didn't know what to do. And I, I thought about writing a book, right? What not to do when your friend is grieving. <laughs> right that um, for me because I'm one of those people who was very awkward in those moments and it's funny because my mother I mean she literally was a hospice social worker I mean you couldn't get more in touch with your comfort level of death than that and yeah. I'm the complete opposite so that would be a really it's helpful hard. helpful book and you know because everybody wants to do right and then you don't want to say the wrong thing so then you end up saying nothing and that's yeah. even worse from you know I know from what people have said over the years you know and so forth so. Yeah, saying anything is better than nothing, even if you trip up. My biggest piece of advice, just as an aside, is not to ask a widow or somebody who's grieving like this, 
How are you doing? That's like a horrible, don't ask because their life sucks. They're not happy. Nothing's good. Asking about the moment in time. How was your day? How was last night? How's work going? Do you want to go for a walk? But not that, you know, mournful. How are you doing? That right. was like the worst. So that's just yeah. my little tip for the day. Yeah, no, that's good. And I think that also comes from, you know, you too, like you're trying to move forward in your life and your life is about moving forward on a day to day and having to, you know, having people come up with that. Everything isn't always so heavy, right? Like you want to just talk to people sometimes lightly as well. Right. So I love that. All right. Thank you. So, all right. So let's kind of get into it. So now you are kind of, you've gone into therapy. um, Your friends moved in with you. So this has been about how long now have passed, would you say? So let's say, so he passed away in October of 1999. And in the fall of 20, uh, I was about to say 2020, yeah, 20, <laughs> 2000, the fall of 2000, um, a new person started at work and she started talking to me about this bike ride that she was involved in. And the company she used to work for used to volunteer. And um, I know that there you have people on the phone from all over the country and world actually. Um, so the pan mass challenge, I had never heard of it before. And I've lived in Massachusetts my whole life, except for my four years of college, the pan mass challenge started in 1980. So we're now in the year 2000. So it's 20 years old and it is the largest athletic fundraising event in the world. And it's in Massachusetts. Like how cool is that? Um, and it's founding really, and it's, you know, life supports one of the leading cancer centers in the world, Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, which is here again in Massachusetts. You know, I and, actually asked my sister because I was reading a little bit about that. Um, and so, and I couldn't remember because my sister had gone through cancer in her early thirties. And I said, were you at Dana-Farber? Cause she's up there and she says, yeah. And I, they saved her life. So yeah, yeah great, great, yeah. great organization. It's a really, it's a really special place. And the founder of the ride lost his mother to cancer very young and he was an athletic guy and he, grabbed a bunch of friends and he said, let's ride our bikes across Massachusetts and try to raise money. And that's really how it evolved. So this friend started at my company and she was involved in the ride and she'd been volunteering for years. And she said, I'm gonna do this ride and I would like to do it in Perry's memory because we had become close friends. So now we're a year after Perry passed away you know, would you help me? Would you consider doing some fundraising with me? And I basically said to her, if I'm going to do it, I might as well do it. Perry was a cyclist. He was a biker. Like what an amazing way to, you know, make a tribute to his memory and do something for good that is going to make everybody feel good. And maybe it'll help me lose some of the weight I've gained too. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And I, I rode a bike. I mean, Perry and I went mountain biking. He did get me into mountain biking during our time together. I was never a road biker, always scared of cars. Um, and this is a road bike ride, not a race. I just um, have to jump in here, though. Again, knowing you at 16, and I, I don't remember you as the athletic type. I remember you were a skier, but I don't really remember you as the athletic type. And so when I learned about this race and what you were doing, I was like, man. So as you guys hear this whole unraveling of this thing, just picture yourself as just the average person who's not out, you know, who's not been, you know, you know, number one in her state in athletics all year, you know, her whole life. This was just, you know, the girl on the couch, like all of us working her life, doing her thing. No, taking I on. did step aerobics, Jill. Oh, you did I step did aerobics. Step I aerobics. forgot. Step aerobics. I forgot. That's correct. And I did Thai bow, so I get it. <laughs> I know. probably did that too. <laughs> yeah. um, I belong to Gold Gym in my area. But again, it was like 30 minutes, except for mountain biking. Perry did get me into mountain biking, which yeah. was really hard. And it's over rocks and you got to go slow or whatever. So yes, definitely from couch potato to now I consider myself a pretty, you know, you are um, an avid (laughs) avid cyclist. Yeah. And you're going to hear the the unfalling, but she's an athlete. Don't let, don't, (laughs) don't let her fool you. I did also ski. I mean, I was athletic, but I did, I never competed in athletic. So anyway, um, so anyway, she talked me into it. I was like, well, what's it about? She's like, well, they have a lot of different options for what you can do, but Let's sign up for one day. It's about a hundred miles. <laughs> okay. So I didn't know what I was getting into. I borrowed a bike from a friend 
And we started training early in that spring. And I should pause for a second and say, now it's maybe closer to a year and a half after Perry passed away. And I was starting to explore dating and I was doing, um, what's the, the speed dating, you know, for seven minutes, you talk to somebody really fast. Right. Across people. I did that a couple of times. I joined J date, which is the Jewish version of match. Um, and I started, I had sold my house and moved into an apartment with another woman that Jill and I did youth group with. Mm -hmm. And she actually introduced me to this guy named Josh who was a really good friend who would go on my J-Date profile and respond to people who were <laughs> reaching out. He would, you know, next guy say, yes, he was dating my, he wanted to date some of my friends, whatever. We just became friendly. And about a week before the first PMC that I participated in, which is, it's always the first weekend in August. Okay. So now we're in 2001. Um, he told me he wanted to date. He was like, I'm done with being friends. I have enough friends. I think we should date. So here's a guy who has now befriended me. I mean, talk about a woman with baggage. You know, I'm about to ride a hundred mile bike ride, you know, in memory of my dead husband who died of colon cancer or small bowel cancer right. in four months. I've got siblings, I've got in-laws, I've got, you know, but he was all in. He was like, let's, let's give it a shot. So, you know, after some random other dates, um, I said, he's my friend first. And I, I do believe that sometimes that makes the best um, connection. I didn't really have much to hide. He had already, he had heard this whole story, kind of was there throughout the journey because I had met him during that year. Um, and yeah, so we started dating. I did my first pan mass challenge. It was not fast, but my friend and I trained a lot. We met three days a week before work and we'd ride 20 miles before work. And then on the weekends we would do, and then we would graduate up. You know, it's like running a marathon. You kind of have a training schedule and you increase your mileage. So that was 2001. And I know you have some additional pictures, but I'll just say yeah. that that year I did it. So is, this, let me see, is this first, wait, here, I'm gonna show this one, hold on. Yes. Is that the first year right there or is that? This is actually the, that's the second year. So, okay. well, that's actually the third year. So 2001, okay. it was just me and my girlfriend. I couldn't find my picture from that year. Mm -hmm. um, and again, it was hard. It, there was no digital photography back in the early <laughs> 2000s. There wasn't a lot. So finding pictures from these early years is much harder than now. Yes, um, in 2002, instead of two riders, we had seven. And that included my father, who then was 60-ish. Um, that's okay. I think I got your We'll get to yeah, there. There he is. There we go. Um, and the following year, my sister joined. And then, additionally, just when we talk about this team expansion idea, Perry's brought one of Perry's brothers decided to ride. He kind of picked up Perry's athletic prowess after Perry passed away and decided he was going to carry on that torch. He joined, and a cousin joined, and other people. And in the early years, it was mostly people who knew Perry. Um, that picture that you just slid by was my mom. She's not a cyclist, but she volunteers every year. This is her flipping hamburgers at one of the rest stops. <laughs> I love it. She I love that me. everybody got, you know, everybody is involved, you know? It's she amazing. hate me for sharing this picture because of the <laughs> hair or whatever. I remember um, your mom. She would hate you for those. So <laughs> shared that picture. <laughs> but it was full family involvement. Um, and as the team grew, Perry's family really embraced it. Um, this picture, so that's my husband, Josh, in the middle. I should mention, I'm go out Josh and I, let me just go back in time for a second. Josh and I, um, we started dating in 01, and we actually got married at the end of 2002. So we, you know, about 16 months later, we got married. So um, Perry's family was absolutely incredible. I mean, talk about pressure. He wasn't nervous to meet my parents. He was nervous to meet Perry's parents because he was like, didn't want to be perceived as taking Perry's spot. Um, but they really embraced him and loved him. So in this picture from right to left is Perry's brother, Matt, who rides the PMC and who actually lives a, a half a block from me now. And I'm still very close with him and his wife, Karen. That's me in the pink pants and Josh. And then another one of Perry's brothers, Dean, and his wife, Suzanne. Um, there is a third brother who is in a later picture, I think, um, who now rides the Pan Mass and has been riding for the last 10 years or so. And you can start to see from these pictures, 
it took on a life of its own. Like every year I would talk to friends or, or people at the hospital will get in touch with me and say, somebody wants to ride the Pan Mass Challenge, but they want to do it in honor or in raise money for a GI cancer. And that's what our team was supporting. So they joined the team. So if you look at this picture, that picture, most people on that team had never met Perry, had never known Perry. Um, this, these are two of Perry's brothers, Matt on the left, Evan on the right. Um, included in that recruiting, you can flip to the picture with Marcy, was my best friend, Marcy, who along this journey got breast cancer. So here I am riding the Pan Mass Challenge, raising money, and all of a sudden, my best friend at the age of 33, so Perry passed, I was 29, so I'm now three or four years into riding the PMC, that's what we call it, she got breast cancer and she's on the right. Um, so, you know, I kept it kept adding to the miss it mission. It was so much more than just riding in Perry's memory, but every year I would have friends that were diagnosed or loved ones, family members that were fighting cancer, friends of friends, my friend's parents passing away. Unfortunately, it's a relentless disease. And so you can see the, the camaraderie. My mom designs these jerseys. They're actually, uh, the design is Perry's initials, PSL. Um, and that's what makes up the design on the jersey. And what you're seeing here is I do a lot of fundraising. And by the way, I know Jill mentioned my link is going to be posted, but um, no pressure to donate. But I do donate and I always want to ride in memory or in honor of anybody who wants me to. So I send notes to my donors to say, let me ride with your loved ones. And I make a card every year with whosoever names they send to me. And I carry it in my pocket and I kiss it and I take pictures with it. And I really do try to honor, um, you know, everybody. This is so much more than just me honoring and riding in Perry's memory now. My mother-in-law is a cancer survivor. My dad had melanoma last year. I mean, it's nonstop. It, 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 unfortunately, it is. So I want to go back to one thing. So after that first ride, right, like you're going to, we're going to continue on your legacy. I mean, you guys can hear this just is built and built. And I want you guys to hear the financial end of it and what it's done for this world in just a minute. But I want to go back to that. After that first ride, what was there something that happened on that ride that made you want to then create a team, do it year after year? Was there something that happened along then? Or was it just something that okay, it's here again, let's start it again. Like what, you know, I feel like there had to have been something that made you, right? Because you didn't sign up to then do it for the next 20 years. You signed up to do it that year, right? So what yeah. was, you know, what happened there a little bit? So we often talk about the Pan Mass Challenge secret sauce, and I'm not sure I can articulate what happened, but I will say my first PMC, it poured for 60 miles of the 90 something miles that I rode. So nobody in their right mind would want to ride it again. <laughs> yeah. It was not that fun of an experience. But people come out on the streets, we're riding along the streets of, you know, throughout Massachusetts down to Cape Cod and people come out and they cheer you on and little kids hold up signs that say, I'm alive because of you. And you start weeping. And then there's pictures along the way of children who are being treated in the Jimmy Fund Clinic at Dana-Farber. And you see their names and their pictures. And along the way, I'll, I'll tell you, they, they become the pedal partners of the teams of the Pan Mass Challenge. And our team has had many pedal partners throughout the years. Um, and it's just this huge emotional wash. And I think for me, Besides the fact that I'm doing good and I'm giving back and I'm making lemonade out of lemons, as my father-in-law likes to say, it is this one moment in time that I feel like I can, I can really bring Perry's memory to life and, and make him proud and do something good for mankind. Because so much of our lives were like, I'm sitting at my desk right now, I'm doing my work, I'm schlepping my kids, I'm focused. And... I love to, I love the idea that, you know, it's this, this weekend. And of course there's a ton of buildup and now I call it my second full-time job because I manage this big team, but it's an opportunity for me to be outside of myself and give back. And my feeling is if I can pedal my bike and make a difference for other people, for other young couples that maybe don't lose their spouses, that there's treatments and there's recovery and there's hope that I didn't have with Perry. 
then I feel like that's the biggest gift of all. And I really got a sense of that that first year. So literally I was like, dad, can, can I have a bike for my birthday? I mean, I was going to be 30 years old. So it was like a big birthday. My mom wanted to buy me a fancy watch. I was like, I think I want a bike, um, you know, because I, I wanted a, a better bike. I had ridden that first year on a borrowed bike that didn't quite fit me um, to think about that this was going to be a thing. And then just the recruiting and the growth and the family and the non-family. And it's really become so much more than just about Perry. Yeah, I love that. So, so you shared a little bit about what PMC is. So, P, you know, uh, and they're so they're raising money for Dana Farrer for all all cancers, but each individual team has their own specific cause. Would you say, or I'm not sure if that's the right way to put it. So, some teams do, some teams don't. So, most people ride individually, but you do have an opportunity to create a team if you want, and your team can have a dedicated fund at Dana Farber. It's a process to build it and get it together, but we did. Okay, so talk, yeah, so talk to us about the t- how, how did Team Perry evolve and what it's doing and all that good stuff. Yeah. Sure. So shortly after Perry passed away, before I got involved with the PMC, we wanted to do something, a benefit or something. And I didn't send you any pictures about this, Jill. But um, my sister lived in New York City at the time, and she was very involved in promotions. And we decided that we were going to raise money for Dana Farber for Crohn's and colitis because. Uh, we think that maybe his cancer evolved ultimately out of Crohn's disease and the Special Olympics because he was an athlete and he was actually, he volunteered for the Special Olympics. So we earmarked those three charities to do some fundraising for. And my sister coordinated this huge bash gala in New York City with silent auctions and it was amazing. And we ended up raising a couple hundred thousand dollars. And so we found out that if we donated $100,000 to Dana Farber, that we could get what's called a named fund, right? So you can give money to any hospital or whatever, but to have a name on it, there it has to be at a certain threshold. So the $100,000, it put a name on the fund. And then when I started getting involved in the Pan Mass Challenge, we realized that we could funnel money through the Pan Mass Challenge to that named fund that we had set up to support GI cancer. And for those of you who don't know, I mean, any cancer you support is amazing. And most cancers, keep in mind, there's a lot of uh, similar um, issues with genetics, right? So you, there might be a scientific breakthrough in a breast cancer trial that's happening, but that breakthrough is gonna to apply to colon cancer or lung cancer or whatever. So it's all great, regardless of where you where you send the money. But GI cancer is responsible for about a third of the deaths in the world related to cancer. And so that's a big chunk. I did and not so, know that. I did yeah. not know that. Wow. 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 So when we created this fund and we started raising money and all of a sudden we were getting to a point, you know, four or five years in where we were approaching a million dollars. So, you know, we started with 100,000 from that benefit and now we're a couple of years in, I've got 30 people on the team, they're raising between two and $10,000 each. So we have a couple hundred thousand dollars going to the Dana-Farber. And when we hit a million dollars, they ba- we said, what are our options? And they basically said, well, we can start to think about you funding a fellowship. Now you think about people you know who went to medical school and they vie for fellowships in their certain area. I mean, these are hard positions to come by. And these are the people that are doing the research at the research hospitals, whether it's Dana-Farber or any other hospital. And so to be able to fund a fellow, again, to have a named fellow, there is a Perry S. Levy fellow at Dana-Farber. And basically we fund their salary and we fund their research on an annual basis. Um, and now that the, the money has grown, um, and I know this was kind of, I, maybe the punchline, but this year, actually already this year, we have surpassed in total, not this year's ride, but in total eight and a half million dollars that we have donated to Dana Farber just from my team. Um, and just so you know, for contact. I mean, I don't know. I feel like more like this. I don't know. I mean, that's just, don't but pause on that right? for a moment. $8.5 million. I mean, how many people's lives have you helped and changed? That's just amazing. Amazing. So sorry, go on. I'm just blown Thank away by you. that number. Yes. Yeah. So we've been lucky because we've been able to have choices and potentially fund particular research projects. 
Um, and the PMC as a whole has raised almost $800 million. Wow. So we're just like a tiny little fraction of, you know, the overall mission of the Pan Mass Challenge. But again, you're right. Eight and a half million is nothing to sneeze at. No. And some years when the department head has come to me and said, Melissa, we have the money in your fund. We want to hire two fellows. And we have two separate, you know, research labs that we want to fund. We're all in. We're like, let's do it. So we get to collaborate with the leaders at the Institute, which is really incredible. And one of the other things that the Pan Mass has done, and you can flip the page, is I mentioned those pictures leading up to um, with the pictures of the children that are receiving treatment at um, Dana Farber and the Jimmy Fund. So the little girl in the middle that says, you can do it, Team Perry, uh, that's Raina. Uh, Raina actually became our pedal partner back in 2018. This picture was from 2018. And by the way, you can see we're under an umbrella. It poured. When I say poured, I mean, it was a monsoon that year um, for the Pan Mass Challenge. But again, we rode. I, I'm getting wet. I'm cold. I might get hypothermia, but I don't have cancer. So I can keep pedaling was our was our feeling. Um, and Raina was being treated for leukemia. Um, I, I embrace these pedal partners. They become family. I adore her, her mom. You can see her sisters right behind. We make the, her mom is on the right holding the other sign. We make t-shirts that say pain is temporary and pride is forever on the back. That's like uh, our team signature t-shirt. Um, and I've been in touch with Raina. She uh, went through her entire treatment. She was in remission for just under two years. Uh, and last Monday, I got a text from Jen, her mom, telling me they were back at Children's Hospital in Boston and the leukemia was back. And so actually two nights ago, um, I spent several hours at Children's Hospital with Raina. We did our nails. You can see I have sparkles. <laughs> did them. Um, and I brought her her favorite Chinese food and I was able to spend time with her before um, she starts her chemotherapy again, which actually started today. So it's another very meaningful way to connect with the mission and the families who are going through a nightmare. She's yeah. 13 years old and going through her second, her second bout of cancer. Yeah. So, and how and how validating for you to continue on what you're doing, right? I mean, to you know, to actually see the physical person who that you you know what you're like when you say when you're running, like when you're riding, right? Whether it's raining or not, you know she's waiting there at the end with her sign for you, and you're gonna do what you have to do. And so I love that it's not just about the riding, it's not just about the raising money, but it's also about, you know, who that you're 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 doing this for. That means, you know, as much to you as well. Um, so I'm just curious, what was uh, the last year like? Did you guys ride? Did you, what was? Yeah, the so this picture was taken at the end of 2019 ride. So that was the, the last year we were together officially at the end of the Pan Mass Challenge. This is these okay. pictures are taken at the end of day one. Um, when the pandemic hit, in you know, March, I don't think you said you said hundred mile, but is that is that how long the pan pan? No, no, no. So, so that is an option. Um, the the full spectrum ride is actually from Sturbridge, Massachusetts. If you know Massachusetts, it's a <laughs> it's an elbow. So Sturbridge is up here. You ride down to the Cape, you ride over the Cape Cod Bridge, and then you ride all the way to the tip of, of Provincetown, wow. which is the, the tip of the curve of Massachusetts. And it's a 192 mile full ride. Wow. And I've done different routes. I've done um, the two day ride several times. In 2019, I did that ride. Um, I've done the one day ride. It kind of depends on logistics and family and who's doing what. And if I had, I had a wedding on a Sunday after the first day, so I, you know, but um, you have the option and they even now have 25 mile rides and 50 mile routes and options. So anybody can really get involved. Yeah, that's nice. They do that. now. You don't have to commit to um, the crazy. <laughs> that is for sure. So talking about the crazy, tell us about the crazy last year. Yeah. And I'm not sure if the, yeah, I'm not sure where so I am in the pictures of this, but I'm just kind of, yeah, so this, this this picture was taken the last week in February of oh, 2020. So a couple so, weeks before the world shut down. 
we were celebrating our success of 2019, where we raised as a team just for that year over seven hundred thousand dollars. That was one of our, or maybe six. I can't read the check, um, but it was one of our biggest fundraising years. And again, we always have this winter celebration. We invite new recruits that are interested in joining our team. This is taken at my parents' home. Dana Farber comes with this big check. I get to sign the big check. It's really fun. Oh, very cool. Um, so this was taken a couple weeks before shutdown. The world shut down, and none of us knew, right, that we were where we were going to be. Oops. So we kicked off the ride thinking about. We kicked off the year. Um, moving to virtual team meetings and getting everybody excited until we waited to hear what the decision was in terms of the ride. And in March, we thought by August, we'll be fine, right? We all thought our kids were gonna be back to school in April. So um, anyway, the ride did not happen. And what the Pan Mass Challenge did was they decided, we're gonna do what's called a reimagined PMC. We're gonna have everybody create their own PMC. Ride as many miles as you want. Do it whatever weekend you want. Don't do it on the actual weekend on the actual route because they wanted to avoid crowds. They sent us all of our gear, our shirts, our, you know, paraphernalia. And they said, you know, do what you can, stay to the mission and keep fundraising. And that's what we did. And for the first time ever, I coordinated um, six separate mini rides for our team members divided by distance that people wanted to ride, the speed in which they ride. Um, and You're if not you, joking, it's a second full-time job. Yeah, it is a second full-time <laughs> job. I think I sent you a picture maybe of the end result. Uh, maybe I didn't, I don't know. Um, where, Oh yeah, it's it's two pictures ahead um, if you want to flip. So this was last August, and then we can go back to my family and my right. parents. One more. Hold well, on. this picture was taken at the beginning. That's Oops, oh, sorry, hold oh, on. Oh. Now I'm all screwed up. Hold on. There we go. Let me get back one. Do you not have it? I think you don't have it in your deck. Oh. Okay. It was one more picture. It was picture number 19. Anyway, oh. um, I don't think I have a way to share it, but yeah, uh, we so we all got together, we wore um, buffs when we needed to, if we were going to be close together. And we did end up celebrating as a team, about 25 of us came together um, at Perry's brother's house. And we had an ice cream truck and we brought food and we did it socially distanced and safe. Um, but we managed to ride and we managed to raise still over $430,000, even though the PMC released riders of any fundraising commitment which was a shock because that has never happened. You commit to the PMC and you commit to the money that you agree to raise for your route that you're riding, whether you ride it or not. You fall off your bike, you break your collarbone, something happens, you can't ride, you are still committed, to, oh, there it is, to the fundraising commitment. So we had riders all over the country doing rides. Uh, this group in the middle that you see with the ice cream truck, we're all in our buffs. That's the group that got together to ride. Um, but you can see lots of different people going out, doing their rides, ride, re, uh, wearing our Pain is Temporary t-shirts. And last year was our 20th year anniversary. So it was a little sad that we weren't all together. Um, but it was really an unbelievable experience um, and a new experience for me to actually, I had my teenage kids, you know, manning the water stops along the route. So we were hydrated um, and we still made it a really special occasion. And I'm really happy to say that we are back on track. It's going to look a little different this year okay. than it has in the past, but we are back on track uh, to ride the first weekend in August, which is August 7th and 8th, I think. Oh. Um, so you've been yeah. doing your training and all of that? I'm doing my training. I actually have my long ride. So I usually do one long ride leading up to the training ride. That is scheduled for Monday. I actually took the day off of work with a couple other teammates. And we'll be doing a 68-mile training ride, which will be our longest training ride, even though on the day of we'll ride, um, I think it's 93 miles. Wow. And so how long does 93 miles take you? Um, well, it depends how long really you stay at the rest stops. Um, the PMC <laughs> was really good about spacing out the rest stops every 18 to 23 miles or so. I, on average, ride 14, 15 miles an hour, which is not a speed demon. It's respectable, I think. 
Um, again, it's not a race. There are people who do the Pan Mass Challenge that ride 24 miles an hour, like the guys in Tour de France. You know, not me. No, that's not it. Yeah. No, it's not <laughs> it. It's about the experience. And so it really depends. My dad's going to, my dad just turned 80 in February. He's doing the ride. Wow. If he needs more time at the rest stop, we stay at the rest stop. And even though, you know, I could probably ride faster, I definitely ride faster than my sister. It's a family affair on PMC weekend. And I kind of leave my teammates that I train with throughout the year behind and stay with my family. Um, my brother-in-law now also rides my sister's husband um, with the double wedding. And uh, it really is just a very special weekend. So we're excited. Um, the PMC is not doing as much of the logistical support this year as they have, like ferries and buses and food, real like incredible food. Um, so I'm only riding one day this year, just from a logistical standpoint, um, but only is still almost a hundred miles. Oh, right. And, and, and honestly, as much as the, the, the race is there, it's the fundraising that you do behind the race that ultimately is, is the point of, um, of what, but I love that. I, I mean, you said that you kind of leave your teammates behind to be with your family. And I love that because obviously that's what this was what, started for in the beginning. And that even though it's grown beyond Perry, you know, for, like you said, for that weekend, it's about Perry and about, you know, family and about that. And, and um, I, I've just loved this conversation and I have as much respect as I had for you before I even have a deeper, deeper respect for you and all you do, because, you know, you guys heard all of that. That's time with two teenage boys, a husband, a full-time job and to, you know, to have made that your mission in life, right? I mean, you know, it's yeah. It's, and thanks for saying that, Jill. If you don't mind bringing up the picture of my family, I do yes. have to do a quick shout out. So, as I mentioned, I, I married Josh in in two thousand two. Yeah, no, that's perfect. Um, and we have a son, Max. That's the older one. My younger son, Ryan. Uh, they've been incredible supporters of this mission. You know, I, I joke about the the baggage that Josh married when he came into it, and he's been an unbelievable supporter. Um, imagine the strength of his, you know, of his being to be able to support me as I pursue this mission. His family supports me. They contribute to my fundraising. When our kids were little, he held down the fort and gave up golf time so I could go out and do these training rides. Um, and so I, you know, I can't thank and stress enough what um, an incredible support he and my kids have been. My older son is telling me that he's going to ride with me next year, which will be awesome. Um, if he gives up overnight camp, we'll see. Um, I was so, curious if the kids ever rode with you, but I guess it's yeah. Camp. So yeah. Max, Max rides like he'll go on a ten or fifteen mile ride with me, mm -hmm. but they've never ridden the Pan Mass Challenge. And you can, as of 16, you have to be 16 to ride the official route. The oh, shorter okay. routes, the 25 and the 50, you can ride at 13. And they also have kids rides, which my kids always did when they were little, as an additional like little annex PMCs. They do kid rides all around um, New England. And so they have participated in various ways. They've raised money, they've gone door to door, they've, you know, sold snacks at baseball love games, it, it. all committed to um, our fundraising efforts. We've cleaned out the house and done yard sales and and all of that. So That's this awesome. is a picture of us taken during the pandemic. I don't know if any of you guys had those front door pictures, oh, front steps pictures. Yeah. This was our front steps picture with our two kitties um, about three months into the pandemic. <laughs> No, oh, that's awesome. And, you know, that's amazing that the support, because you are right. I mean, to have found a man to take take all of that on and not only that, but then to let you, 20 years later, you're still, it's very, you know, wrapped up in. And that does take a special man to be able to um, take that on and also give you that place to fly, right? For you to fly and to support you. Like, you know, I, I have a good man like that too. And he's always, you know, take care of the, take care of the home front so that you could do what you needed to do and, and um, something is special. So speaking of support, how can, I, I've got, you guys can see down there, that's the link to just kind of learn more about Team Perry in general. Um, but tell us how we can, you know, support you. I know I said in the actual post that, you know, that saved with this is the link to donate, but how, just talk to us, how can we help you out here? And yeah, so you can actually go to that website and find a way, the place to donate. Um, okay. there's a link on the website to donate and that will link right to, um, all of the members on the team. You can find my name, Melissa Jacoby, or you can just, 
you can just donate to the team, the general team fund. Um, you know, maybe a little note that says, you know, I'm a mojo woman. Uh, just so I know where it's coming from would be amazing. Um, and, you know, I would just say, sh share the message, uh, whether you donate or not, supporting any efforts around you or friends. You know, I used to always get, um, you know, solicitation, friends running the marathon doing, and I always donated, but I didn't think too much about it until I started asking myself. And I've, I've just been so overwhelmed by people's willingness. Now I get emails saying, hey, you haven't sent out your solicitation email yet. What's happening? You know, or or I, I need to give a little more at the end of the year. Can I give early to your fund before I close out my taxes? I mean, people are incredibly generous and you'd be surprised how many people have been touched by cancer. I mean, you know, we now live in a world where you say you don't know anybody who wasn't touched by COVID. And COVID made cancer so much more complicated. Um, and so the hospitals really have needed even more funding to be able to support the safety protocols of COVID while treating cancer patients because their immune system is suppressed. Yeah. So yeah. it's even deepened um, the need and the mission. Yeah, you know, I had not even put those two and two together, but absolutely. So even more so. There's no vaccine. Yeah. So for cancer, for cancer, yes, no, no. vaccine, yes, correct. Uh, maybe one day, you'll never know. Who knows where everything is going? So, um, and certainly with people like you, there is the hope of on the horizon being able to sponsor those fellows who are doing the work that in the research, you know, those you know fellows. Fel I say fellows, but is there a is like a fellow? Is the there's I know is there like a. Um, there's not a feminine version. Feminine, or that's the word I'm looking fellow. for. Thank you. <laughs> yes. we, we've had many female fellows. Female Unfortunately, fellows. Okay. <laughs> that is a, a, you know, a male term that has carried through despite the gender of the actual person that gets appointed. So they will have to fix that. In, in this <laughs> One of these days, they will. Yeah, no, I was just curious. Well, that is awesome. So maybe just, you know, share with us maybe, you know, a couple of little last final words and then we'll say goodbye and um, and wrap things up. But I can just say from for myself, like I said, not really having known everything in all of the details of your story, um, you're an incredible woman. And um, I think that you are gonna be, you know, I, I hope when everybody watches this, they feel as inspired as I do. Um, so you're a perf perfect guest for the Woman With Mojo show, without a doubt. So yes, yeah, so last final words for us. Yeah, so first of all, thanks. Um, I haven't shared the full story in quite some time and it's always nice to reflect and see um, you know, where this has all come from and, and where we are today. Um, people always ask me, you know, what are you gonna do when they do find this ultimate you know, silver bullet cure for cancer? Um, and I think now I'll find another cause to ride for because I just feel like the feeling that I get from giving back, and it doesn't—it doesn't have to be on such a big scale. I would say, um, you know, my kids volunteer. I drag them to a—I don't drag them. I kind of drag them <laughs> to a place called Cradles for Cray Crayons here in Massachusetts, and they build little, you know, clothing packets for underprivileged children. And they walk out of there and they feel amazing. And it's three hours of their time. And I just feel like, you know, we get so busy in our lives. If you can make time to give back in whatever way is exciting for you and a mission that you're passionate about. I think it really does help to motivate you to have your mojo, to feel like you're, you know, you're important and you're giving back when, when sometimes we kind of can drown in our own sorrow or, you know, menopause is hitting and I'm having those night sweats and I put on a couple extra pounds. And, um, but at the end of the day, Raina doesn't care how much I weigh. Um, and my bike doesn't really care how much I weigh. Um, if I can pedal, you know, my bike to to do good, it, it's it's an incredible feeling. And I just I want that for everybody because I really do think giving back gives us so much more to live for. Yeah, and I think I think when you get out of your own head and do that, it lifts you up as well, and it helps you move forward as well. So beautiful. Well, I am want you to hang out there, so don't go anywhere. I'm just going to wrap this up, and then I'll be right back with you. But thank Thanks you so again much. so much. Uh,
All right, ladies. So that is another Women with Mojo show. Was I right? Like Melissa, awesome, right? And she definitely is a woman with mojo. If you ladies know any other women with just inspiring stories, whether there's they're an author or they have a business or like M Melissa, you know, has this amazing cause, something to share, an inspiring story, please send them their, my way. I think it just inspires us all to do good when we hear these stories. And we, like Melissa said, you don't have to write at 192 miles, you find what touches you. And when you do that, when you give back, you find your own mojo, I truly believe. So thank you ladies so much for joining. I'm gonna send you off here. Let's see.